Hey everybody, welcome back to Chris White Reports. This is Colonel Chris White here in Johannesburg with uh, none other than Gareth Booth. Gareth, how's it going? Good to see you. Good to see you. Very good. We just had a conversation uh, on his program. I was lucky. I enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it as well. <laughs> that was good. It was very, very good. So is it? You've got a lot to say about a lot of things. That's why it's nice to talk to you. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. Some people don't like that. <laughs> Those are exactly the people that we don't like. You know, they say that um, when you're taking flight, it means you're over the target. That's probably right, both in military terms and in terms of saying what you've got to say, right? Exactly. So, Jared, uh, you know, I have viewers all across the world, about half my audience is South African, but, and I think pretty much everybody in South Africa has heard of you, knows about you for your days uh, in radio and what you do now. Uh, but a lot of people around the world don't know about you. Uh, did you first come to prominence in the media sphere uh, with 702? Is that where you started? I started doing commercial radio at 702. I was already on campus radio before that. I did that too, campus radio. Yeah, and got fired from there. Why did you get fired? I was doing, <laughs> I was doing outrageous stuff. And it was, Rumor has it, I was going to ask about that. I should have got fired. I, I was, for the right reasons. Um, then I did, I, I did a show on 702 for a while. I took over from the legendary John Burks, who, who really was a massive, massive uh, influence on, on South African radio. And then after that, went to uh, Five FM, which is a commercial music station, because I was talking to people on 702 who were double my age. My parents' friends would say, hey, great show this morning. My friends would go, what, you're on radio? Oh, you're on radio. And so I realized it was time to sort of uh, talk to people my own age. And, and then I, it was a very deliberate uh, decision to do that. At that time in South Africa, it was also, you know, things were, were fun. People were hopeful and optimistic. I'm not saying they're not now, but it's not. And what was this time for? So it was probably um, the 702 sort of era ended around 2000 and two, three, okay. and then from there until I started to Central was you know, about 10 years that I was doing commercial music radio. And now, we had lots of fun. We, we oh, no doubt. Yeah. But you know, it's interesting because uh, depending who you talk to, people have different views of you. I mean, a lot of people really like you. Some people find you a bit uh, cheeky. Um, one of my viewers uh, commented in person said, I can never listen to him on 72. He was so foul mouthed. I never heard you on 72. Oh, mouth, you should hear me now. <laughs> well, that was my response. I said, I will I mean, look, also, I was, I was in my 20s, and it was important to do anything to get attention. So I understand that. And I don't think I'm like that anymore. I don't think anyone stays in that place unless they all have maturation. It's just arrested development, you know? And as far as I'm concerned, I think that you do mature. You get, you get more sensible. You become more interested in, in, in kind of other people's opinions than saying your own. Um, and I think that that's just part of growing up. So I'm, I'm open to all the uh, the improvement and the criticism I can get. <laughs> no, it wasn't criticism. It just, uh, she said that she loves your content now if you watch it, which I find ironic. You know, that it's no, people change. People do change. We all change. And listeners change too. So you have an interesting program in which you have uh, co-hosts to come on there with you and have conversations about things. Um, where did that develop? Was the concept you just came up with it or just, just, just developed on its own or what? Probably more as a reason to dilute me so that I don't bore people to death than anything else. But it's, it's also kind of getting different people's opinions in. And all of them, you know, and there are regulars and there are people like you who I speak to every year or two. But I, well, you can do that more often if you like. We can. <laughs> I, I, I love having different inputs because it leads to, you know, a lot of South Africans in particular are very anti-argument. Yes. I think an argument is probably the most valuable kind of interaction you'll have with someone, especially people you like. Yeah. If you can truly argue with someone and still like them before and after the argument, then you can say you're friends. Exactly. And those are the people you're likeliest to learn the most from. If you just sit down and it's two people who agree on everything, which is what worries me about what we talk, because we do agree on a lot of things. That's true. That's um, true. It, can, it can become very tired very quickly. Or you have people who don't agree with us saying, oh, well, it's just those two idiots talking to each other. We can write them off. And then disregarding what may be occasionally, even with us, quite valuable material that you have. No, I'm of the same mind. I, I enjoy conversations that, that I find challenging. If someone challenges my view and they have a different view, I like that. Because I like the defense of you. And if, if maybe I'm wrong or I need to adjust, that's an eye-opening experience. Me too. It's rare, but it's not an experience. And then, and then, you know, the same goes for just having fun and being entertaining. I mean, you want people around you who you can laugh with and you can joke with and you don't take everything super seriously. And 
no, like not some blue haired feminist who has no sense of humor. Well, I'll look, if I change my program channels to that and I identify differently, I have millions of views. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me ask you this question. You got me self identifying it. I mean, we're not talking about sexual orientation or gender. No, but self identification politically. Would you identify yourself as a libertarian, a conservative? That's uh, a really difficult question. I, I, I think it is difficult. That's why I, I used to, I mean, on certain things. You used to be kind of liberal, didn't you? I still am on, on very many things. I don't, I don't really have a dog in the fight for gay marriage. Yeah. Go ahead. You know, I really don't, I don't mind about um, people identifying as whatever. Whatever they want to do. Or whatever they want to do. It's not a big deal to me. Where I have a problem with that stuff is when you impose mm. on me certain kinds of speech. And I think, you know, it was Chesterton who said, if you are in your 20s and you're not a liberal, you don't have a heart. Right. And if you're in your 40s and you don't, you're not a conservative, you don't have a brain. Right. And I think that's about right. I mean, I found what I've started to appreciate more, and this is possibly a reason why some people really didn't like me in the beginning. And I can understand it now with the benefit of hindsight. I was very hard on religion because I was a, a militant, outspoken atheist for a very long time. You know, in, in the mold of kind of Sam Harris, and Christopher Hitchens, Richard, Richard Dawkins, because I found those people to be my intellectual heroes of the time. What I've come to realize now is that actually, religious people are probably our best allies in the fight against complete nutcase wokeism. And I would rather be on the side of a fundamentalist Christian or an Orthodox Jew than I would be on the side of a, a, a trans activist, frankly. Or worse still, those people who believe that everything is a social construct and that nothing is true. You know, Franz Fanon type stuff. I yeah, just, you really can't live life according to that philosophy. It doesn't work. So, so when you ask me if I'm a conservative or a liberal, there are still certain things that I'm, I'm kind of conservative about. Um, and among those things are, you know, family values, sure. uh, the environment, frankly. I think I'm a conservative when it comes to that stuff. Um, I like the idea of, a, of less government, so you could argue that I'm a libertarian. But libertarians have disgraced themselves in many ways. They have. They have. And, and to have this idea, especially in a country like, like I live in, South Africa, where if you become too much of a libertarian, you're actually just hiding ahead in the sand. Fine, I've got solar, I've got a borehole, I don't have to worry about this. I get my groceries from X, Y, and Z. I've got a gun. You know, you, you insulate yourself from certain social responsibilities and civil responsibilities. I don't think that that's a very responsible way to live. I don't either. I think, you know, we, no, live, in, we, live, we live in human communities, whether you want to or not. One of the isolation is you can do it to, to a degree, but you're still dependent on society one yeah. way or another. Whether you like it or not. Unless, but I, but I, I'm definitely, unless you're the Unabomber and you live in Montana. No, you see, again, <laughs> you get these weirdos in South Africa too. I'm definitely not a leftist. Yeah. No, no, that's pretty clear to me. And, and I ask the question because I don't think there's blade white and throwing. And if I'm a center right conservative, but that's not entirely accurate either because I believe in traditional liberal values. Free speech, freedom of assembly, those, those are liberal values. Those are liberal oh, no, values. these days, they're, they're conservative values. Well, I, they have become conservative yeah, values, but it's in their so liberal tradition. Like, I, you ask me what the thing is that I've always believed in the most, yes. and it's been like a bit of a sacred card to me, it was freedom of speech, and it remains freedom of speech. It should be. Within, you know, you don't have any limits in that in, in the U.S., but here in South Africa, we have hate speech laws. They try to bring them in. Well, I, I, think, I, think they're, they're, I think they're an abomination. If people are so offended by the use of the K-word, uh, then they've got an issue. I realize the historical significance of it, but the way you normally deal with... goes to the N-word in America. Exactly. The, the way you normally deal with people who are anti-social and use such... Is you ignore it, you ostracize it, or, stay away from it. Or they do you the favor by using that terminology, letting you know that this is not someone you want to spend a whole lot of time with. Exactly. So would, you rather, the state would, you, rather have, would you rather have the government come into private speech no. and actually tell people that because you've said X, Y, and Z, you should go to jail? No. And would you rather have them eavesdropping on you so that they can find the things that they can nail you for? Or would you rather have your friends speak honestly and then realize, hang on, that's not it's really not a friend, friend I want. Yep, exactly. Um, I think the latter is far more persuasive. We, we're 100% we're agreeing on that. I find it very frustrating when, when states try to limit speech. And we're seeing in America now, we have freedom of speech guaranteed by the First Amendment. These are inalienable or unalienable, depending on the same word. 
Yeah, same thing. I prefer inalienable, inalienable rights, the God-given rights, uh, whether you believe in the deity or not. Sure. But they're, they're natural rights. That's what in other words, they don't come from the state. That's right. They don't come they from the pre- natural rights. They predate the they are Predate the existence state. of the state. That's correct. So, but we've seen collusion by my own government with tech companies, in particular mm-hmm. Twitter. We have the evidence of now, and there's no denying. You know, there was. Aren't you uh, glad South Africa birthed Elon Musk to send him over there to save Twitter? <laughs> That's not why he came, but in the end, that might be what happened. No, he doesn't have a whole lot of love for South Africa. Now, and, you know, look, a lot of people don't like Elon Musk. I, I don't entirely trust him, but what I say about him is an absolutely brilliant entrepreneur. And like most entrepreneurs uh, who are successful, he's a bit of a wackadoodle in my view at times. And that's okay. Yeah, I, I don't sure. have a problem with that. But uh, I'm not going to vote for, for, for the president. <laughs> that's, that's it. But then I didn't vote for the current occupant either, used to say. No, but uh, we've seen like uh, the federal government, the FBI paid Twitter $3.4 million for their time spent. Now, to be fair, if the Federal Bureau of Investigation needs information from a telecommunications company or a social media company or a business be able to get it. with a warrant yeah. issued by a competent judge with, right. with reasonable, just possibility, well, they didn't do that. They simply asked for the data and they were compensated. That makes Twitter an agent of the federal government. Right. And that is a violation of the federal government. That's right, and that is that's a serious, serious situation. Um, that really disturbs me. Here in South Africa, I worry about the, the speech laws that you have and, and the constraint because you have criminal injury. If someone's feelings are hurt, they can take you to trial. You can sue over that. Steve Holtmeyer said something recently uh, about trans asking a question, and uh, apparently he's being taken to court over it. I, I saw it's very difficult to win those cases, and yeah. the quantum is not very big. So, you know, someone will win like 20,000 rand, mm-hmm. which is was it worth your while? Your legal fees are probably more than three hundred thousand rand. You know, so it's it's a it, it is a it's a funny piece of common law that I remember studying in, in second year. Mm-hmm. But as with anything in speech law, if you can prove that something is true and it's in the public interest, you can't be held liable for it. No, I hear you. You know, it's funny because uh, I've been very active on LinkedIn for a number of years. I used to post twenty or thirty uh, articles on Africa with analysis every day. Until after Trump got a spicy cough, I did a posting of a satirical comment about the Chinese Communist Party. And someone complained and mass reported my, my first time ever on LinkedIn. This was a few years ago uh, when he got it. Open. So it was October 20th, it was. And then um, LinkedIn took down my post. Hmm. So I wrote to them and I was greatly offended. I said, I, I post 10,000 articles here in the past 10 years or so. And I've never been accused of that. Who I, they accused me of bullying. I said, Who did I bully? The President of the United States is a public figure. The Chinese Communist Party is not even a person. To their credit, 43 minutes later, I received an email. They apologized and restored my article. Good. But guess what happened? I don't trust LinkedIn anymore. It belongs to Microsoft. I've never put, I almost post nothing there anymore. That's led to self censorship because I don't want to lose my account because I rely on the business context. Yeah, and that's I, I what happens. Very often, chilling effect. I often think about that because I am not as, I'm not, I'm not as outspoken as I, I might like to be because. The cost-benefit analysis just doesn't operate in my favor when I have. Yeah. So people go, oh, well, you've, you know, you've become a bit more PC, you've become a bit boring, or whatever. I said, and listen, I, I, I have to pay bills. And that's not always the case. But a lot of our clients get very nervous when I make my mouth open up and say the things that they don't necessarily agree with. And I can't blame them. They're just trying to sell whatever it is they're selling. No, I understand completely. You know, uh, I've had a few viewers on my programs. You know, I was quite big just a couple years ago before I was shadow banned and my channel saved away and then knew it came back. People were like, why don't you talk about this? I said, well, you know my views on it. Mm-hmm. If you want to hear it clearly, you need to go to Odyssey and Rumble because I have free speech there. I can't do it in these platforms because I'll lose my platform. This is my biggest yeah. platform to reach people. And, you know, everyone's always asking, what's your agenda? South Africans are always suspicious and I understand that. Um, look, I'm not selling uh, solar photovoltaic panels in South Africa. I'm not running for office in South Africa. I'm not trying to get a diamond mine in South Africa. According to Ronaldo Fuzz, I am looking for oil, but there is none here, so I'm, I'm losing that battle. My point is that my agenda is to get people to think critically and to be awake to know what's going on. And somebody's like, you're getting famous in South Africa for facts. I'm like, you need to do a little research to find out who I am. I was famous before I ever started talking about South Africa. And it's not such a great thing to be famous. I'm, no, I'm just looking to get people thinking and engaged and get a bigger audience so more people are having these conversations. But before I let you go, we're going to wrap up here shortly. You've been very generous with your time. 2024. What do you think is going to happen? 
Are we going to have an election first? Will the state of no, disaster? No, no, no. <laughs> there will have an election, and there, and there will be coalition governments, and it's going to get very messy. And there's still this is the place in the world where I can make the most difference. It's the place in the world where I want to live. And I will continue to do, hopefully, as much of those two things, living here and having a good life here and making a difference as I possibly can. Um, that's, that's all I can do. And where I can be helpful and where I can be useful, I will. One thing I will not do is go into politics. Smart move. But now, I'll, I'll be able to. I'll be able to hopefully have a positive influence. Now, on the opposite side of the Atlantic, I I seriously contemplate a run for the Senate um, in the last election. That is mm -hmm. not 18 Republican state out there. No. I, I don't. I don't. I, I'm not so, from Pennsylvania. I don't. I don't know enough people to have that impact. If it's just the one or two, I might have considered. But this next time around, Dr. Oz. <laughs> that was the that was the seat I was going to run for. Now it's look who it is now, Sean Fetterman. Oh my God. Uh, they bring in a convicted criminal to the State of the Union. Uh, uh, just a disaster. Uh, All right. Such an embarrassment. I mean, is he even like. Uh, is he there? there? Yeah, he's not there. No. Who's not there? He hasn't been there. The, but it's a photo finish between him and Joe Biden, right? Oh, uh, gosh. You know, they could they, 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 they have, you know, they, you know, they used to have uh, Vermont cabinet at uh, tea with Ellen. Yeah. They could have tea with John and, and Joe. <laughs> Coffee with John. Two Joe. people slobbering all over. Coffee with John and Joe. Good okay. God. My goodness. Anyway, well, thanks a lot, Gareth. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk again soon. Appreciate your time. Good to see you. All right. Yes. Gareth, Good Good stuff. All right, folks, we're still live. Let me shut down. Thank you. You're very welcome.